sun rises over an English harbour. Each day the rising sun looks down on the same scene. And with each dawn, hard-handed, weather-beaten men follow the winding lanes that their fathers and grandfathers knew down to the sea to fish. They and their boats discharge a simple duty, but from time to time they sail into the pages of English history on another and higher mission. Twice have the little ships of England left their nets and lobster pots ashore and sailed the seas for bigger game. Once when the beacons flashed the news of the Great Armada, and again they sailed 300 years later to the beaches of Dunkirk. gathered on the bullet-swept sand, while the little ships, fishing boats, yachts, motorboats, barges, canoes, anything that floated, streamed to the rescue. That strange fleet came somehow back to port. But all along the coasts of England were harbours with moorings that lay empty and unclaimed. Just as the fishermen answered the call to Dunkirk, so the age-old craft of shipbuilding rose to the nation's call, and on Britain's hillsides, in her woods, the sound of axes echoed. When the demand for wooden ships, and indeed for timber of all sorts, suddenly became urgent, a tremendous burden was placed on an old but tiny industry. Now oak was needed for the frames and planks of the new fleets, and elm for their fittings. The plodding timber dray and the laborious crowbar gave way to giant tractors and mechanized monsters that tossed tree trunks about like matches. The closer the timber comes to its destination, the stronger is the accent on machinery. Until at last the caterpillar grab heaves it onto a lorry that will carry it to a sawmill where the machine is everything. On arrival, the lorry is run under a wooden gantry that carries the travelling cranes which stack and pile the great trunks with smooth efficiency. No time is wasted as the crane lowers its steel grab and swings the four-ton tree up over the piles of seasoning timber below and away to the top of the gantry. the foreman is waiting for it, and before the unwieldy mass has even touched down, he measures it and chalks it into lengths, and the iron grips of the conveyor bear it to the waiting saws. Exit an oak tree, and enter job number umpteen for the shipyard. dies down, and the roaring tempo of the day slows into the peace of the evening. Our tree is already rolling away through the dusk, cut, planed and measured, to its final home in a West Country shipyard. Morning finds a stream of workers crowding through the shipyard gates, and not far behind them comes the timber truck. On this quiet backwater in the West, a handful of skilled shipwrights have trained hundreds of new workers in the mysteries of their craft. Let's listen to the foreman on how it's done. In 17 is 55, and 21 is 76. Hi there. Where are you going to? To the offices, sir. 
I'm starting today as a learner. Well, you wouldn't learn nothing there. Have you ever worked in the shipyard before? You know what this is? Well, a bit of word. A bit of word. And you can get to work out my wages. That's a grown me. Grown be nature to build ship's frames the way they ought to be built. You come with me, my son. And I'll show you the way we build boats. You can muck about with your figures afterwards. See these fellas over there? Well, they'm using adzes. That's the oldest woodworking tool in England. And still the only one for the job of shaping up frames and keels. That'll be part of the keel when they're done with it. So we're starting at the right place, the beginning. After the keels laid down and the moulds, that's the big curved bits, what gives the shape to the frame, is put up. We gets on with the frame and the ribs and the rest of it. They mostly grown to shape, and they got three times the strength of any bent or cut stuff. When the frame's about finished, the mould is taken out and passes on to the next job. So as we don't have the bother of cutting new ones, and at the same time, we make sure that every boat got the same lines as the one that went before it. Well, I reckon you can see for yourself now just how it goes. You keep your eyes open and your mouth shut, and you can't go wrong. As the foreman leaves us on his round, we move off to another minesweeper, where the frames are already finished, and the tricky job of laying the planks is well advanced. Both side and deck planks are shaped on the job, and secured direct to the oak frame. As fast as men with long electric drills bore the holes and move on, their places are taken by others, who beat home the great bolts with sledgehammers, and plug the holes with tar and oakum. Meanwhile, another gang are boring a tunnel for the stern tube that will carry the propeller. Without careful and expert caulking, a wooden ship is useless. Every seam in the planking, both of sides and deck, is carefully packed with oakum, which is hammered home with long-beaked hammers and special caulking chisels, and covered with a layer of boiling tar that will solidify into an imperishable watertight joint. Lastly, the painters apply the final coat of battleship grey to her side. Down under the bulging sides, the launching gang are at work. And as the last block flies out, the launch is on. Down at the fitting out basin, where the thousands of feet of wiring, the deck houses, armaments and numberless accessories of a ship must be mounted, preparations for the new arrival are in full swing. Packed together along the quay are wooden craft of all kinds, minesweepers, fishing vessels, fire floats and the long motor launches for the air rescue service. Now the funnel is being swung aboard a half-finished launch, and even as it is eased down into position, the fitters in the engine room will be connecting up the copper exhaust pipes, and before long, the hull will quiver to the drumming of the engines as they are turned over for their first trials. Inside the men's quarters, the carpenters are busy with the furniture of forecastle and cabins. It hardly seems possible that this tangle of men, tools and equipment will ever be sorted out in time for the incoming crew to take over. But it always is, and a few hours after the men have come down the gangplank with their loaded kit bags, they will have the ship shining like a new pin for the not-so-old old man to come aboard. And now at last, the end of the road is reached. A signal of distress from a damaged aircraft is received by a launch on patrol, and out into the cold, rain-washed morning it heads. From the crow's nest, the lookout sweeps the surface of the water for a dinghy. But the plane is still airborne, and as the launch sweeps up, the pilot bails out, and all eyes are fixed on the white gleam of his parachute as it floats down.
No sooner has the parachute touched down than the rescue begins. No easy job with a tired or perhaps injured man and a choppy sea. Think of it. The long fight with a burning plane. A 2,000 foot parachute jump into an icy sea in half a gale. And he can still smile. But his troubles are nearly over now as he is helped below where hot drinks, expert attention and dry clothes await him. While the launch swings around and with engines roaring full ahead, makes for base. For them, it is just another job done, but a great job. And one of the many that are being tackled day and night by Britain's little ships. Sun rises over an English harbour. Each day the rising sun looks down on the same scene. And with each dawn, hard-handed, weather-beaten men follow the winding lanes that their fathers and grandfathers knew down to the sea to fish. They and their boats discharge a simple duty. But from time to time they sail into the pages of English history on another and higher mission. Twice have the little ships of England left their nets and lobster pots ashore and sailed the seas for bigger game. Once when the beacons flashed the news of the Great Armada, and again they sailed 300 years later to the beaches of Dunkirk. Tired men gathered on the bullet swept sand, while the little ships, fishing boats, yachts, motorboats, barges, canoes, anything that floated, streamed to the rescue. strange fleet came somehow back to port. But all along the coasts of England were harbours with moorings that lay empty and unclaimed. Just as the fishermen answered the call to Dunkirk, so the age-old craft of shipbuilding rose to the nation's call, and on Britain's hillsides in her woods, the sound of axes echoed. When the demand for wooden ships, and indeed for timber of all sorts, suddenly became urgent, a tremendous burden was placed on an old but tiny industry. Now oak was needed for the frames and planks of the new fleets, and elm for their fittings. The plodding timber dray and the laborious crowbar gave way to giant tractors and mechanized monsters that tossed tree trunks about like matches.
closer the timber comes to its destination, the stronger is the accent on machinery. Until at last the caterpillar grab heaves it onto a lorry that will carry it to a sawmill where the machine is everything. On arrival, the lorry is run under a wooden gantry that carries the traveling cranes, which stack and pile the great trunks with smooth efficiency. No time is wasted as the crane lowers its steel grab and swings the four-ton tree up over the piles of seasoning timber below and away to the top of the gantry. Here the foreman is waiting for it. And before the unwieldy mass has even touched down, he measures it and chalks it into lengths, and the iron grips of the conveyor bear it to the waiting saws. Exit an oak tree and enter job number umpteen for the shipyard. dies down, and the roaring tempo of the day slows into the peace of the evening. Our tree is already rolling away through the dusk, cut, planed and measured, to its final home in a West Country shipyard. Morning finds a stream of workers crowding through the shipyard gates, and not far behind them comes the timber truck. On this quiet backwater in the West, a handful of skilled shipwrights have trained hundreds of new workers in the mysteries of their craft. Let's listen to the foreman. 